This is CSAP's Science and Policy Podcast from the University of Cambridge, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policymaking. Recent advances in science and technology have created new opportunities for us to explore and study Antarctica, the deep ocean and near-Earth space in a way that would have been unimaginable just a century ago. In Antarctica, a frozen desert, scientists including chemists, geologists, biologists and astronomers work and live at research stations and field camps. About a thousand people inhabit the continent even throughout the depths of the Antarctic winter. With a recent report in Nature suggesting that Antarctic ice melt will cause two and a half meters of global sea level rise, even if the Paris Agreement's climate goals are met, some of these scientists are doing vital work to understand how Antarctica's role in the global climate system will be affected by anthropogenic climate change. The work of these scientists has been supported by satellite remote sensing, with more than 150 Earth observation satellites we've now put into orbit over the past 40 years, having driven a revolution in our understanding. Satellites such as the European Space Agency's Cryosat-2 and NASA's Landsat are giving us a comprehensive view of the entire continent with the help of visible, infrared, radar, microwave and other high-tech sensors. The technological progress which has allowed us to put so many satellites into orbit has been brought about through improvements in electronics and computing, such as miniaturization, lowering the cost of satellites while improving their sophistication and longevity. While progress in other areas of space technology, such as in rocket propulsion, have been less forthcoming, aside perhaps from ongoing work on reusable rockets pioneered by SpaceX, Advances in electronic engineering have revolutionised the satellite sector and subsequently the wider space industry. In our oceans, another series of technological developments is improving our ability to conduct research and to explore. Oceanographers can now measure changes in the temperature and detect microplastics deep under the surface thanks mainly to advances in robotics. Autonomous underwater vehicles, such as the UK's own Boaty McBoatface can deploy scientific instrumentation at depths of over 6 kilometres. Meanwhile, a network of over 3,000 autonomous floats, known as the Argo network, are continually relaying data about physical, chemical and biological variables back to scientists by satellite. Together, these and other technologies are helping us to understand our planet and the impact of humanity upon it in even the most remote and extreme environments. I'm Rob Doubleday, host of CSAP's Science and Policy podcast. Welcome to this, the first episode of our new mini-series exploring science and policy for near-Earth space, deep oceans and Antarctica. In today's discussion, we're focusing on how recent technological innovation is changing the way that humans are able to explore space, oceans and the Antarctic and what questions these new possibilities raise for policymakers. You've just heard from Anthony Lindley, a CSAP policy intern and PhD student at the University of Southampton. We're joined for this discussion by Dr Graham Turnock, Chief Executive of the UK's Space Agency, Dr Julie Robidart, Head of Ocean Technology and Engineering at the National Oceanographic Centre in Southampton, and Michael Rose, Head of Science and Engineering at the British Antarctic Survey here in Cambridge. So, I just want to begin by asking, you know, each of you in turn, perhaps starting with space, then going to the seas, then going to Antarctica, what sort of technological changes have we seen over the past decade or so? And how has that changed the way humans are exploring and interacting with first space, then then the deep sea and then Antarctica? So maybe I could turn to you first, Graham. Yes, certainly, Robert. So, I mean, I would say sort of three categories of technological change. So the first two would be general. And in those, I would in particular focus on a miniaturization, electronic components. And um, that obviously has been you know, driven by the um, mobile communications industry here on Earth. But it's had major benefits for space because it's enabled us to build uh, smaller, cheaper um, uh, satellites. And, you know, weight is an important issue in space because essentially uh, it's very expensive to lift a kilogram into orbit and the 
the smaller and cheaper you can make something, um, the more commercially sustainable it is. So first of all, I would say the electronic componentry. The second big change, um, which is obviously associated with that, is the development of information processing and um, artificial intelligence more generally. Space has the capacity to generate huge amounts of information or data, shall we say. The challenge is then turning it into information and the ability to analyze that, that data artificially without the need for humans to review vast numbers of sort of data points you know, has been one of the big developments. I was going to say, so does that, does that matter to you where that processing is taking place? Does it, is it about taking processing in space or is it about... Yes, what we're starting to see now is processing in space. Up until recently, again, the sort of challenges of trying to fit a lot of capability into a small space have meant that it was um, more straightforward to transmit the data on mass to Earth and then process it on Earth. But artificial intelligence in particular is starting to be applied in space. And we supported an interesting project led by a company called Spire, which recently resulted in launching a couple of satellites that will monitor shipping and um, you know, work out when a particular you know, container vessels are likely to arrive in port and, and use AI and other techniques for that. So absolutely. Um, I was going to mention my, my third area really is sort of application spec um, specific technology. So, you know, challenges will always drive um, technology development. And one of the most sort of obvious in space is um, uh, the need to launch more cheaply. And, and one can see that um, uh, a challenge being responded to by Elon Musk with his reusable rockets. In one sense, it's not a sort of groundbreaking development like artificial intelligence, but it is, you know, good old fashioned technology, uh, improving the efficiency of the way in which things work. What's the sort of rate of change in terms of, let's say, miniaturization and information processing? Are we in a moment of quite rapid change or are we seeing long running um, improvement? What's the, how do you carry Yeah, that? I mean, so the space sector is really a, you know, subcategory of the general communications uh, sector in that sense. So, you know, Moore's law, you know, if it applies, um, you know, probably applies in space as well, but with a lag, because there is the challenge of making components uh, appropriate for space use, which normally requires some degree of radiation hardening, although that is becoming less of a need for satellites operating in lower orbits where they are protected from radiation by the Earth's magnetosphere. But but the, the general application of Moore's law, you know, should apply to space uh, communications and data. Great. Uh, well, Julie... Sort of turning to you and to think thinking about the ocean, how, what would you kind of what would be your whistle stop tour of, of technological change that's shaping the work that you're able to do? So the ocean is definitely a different medium because you know you've got your liquid uh, surface and you can't really observe the seafloor without penetrating. So there are a few things for the deep ocean that are actually have changed in recent years. So one of them is uh, the mapping of the seafloor. So there's a lot of new technologies that actually allow us to get higher resolution maps, but also the coverage of those maps and integration of different maps across grids. So that's one thing that's changed quite a bit. So we do have a better view of where interesting areas of the seafloor go. We know where the, the plates meet and things like that. That's been known for a while, but now we have higher resolution of those areas and where we might find interesting ecosystems, for example. And then if I'm thinking in general about the deep sea and the benthos, um, there's a different culture now, I think, in uh, our relationship with the deep sea. So what happened in recent years is we've really started getting more and more images from the seafloor and more and more interactions with uh, the public, not just science uh, folks. There's uh, There's been a huge change in, in engagement in real time uh, with remote telepresence. So we can um, have an ROV on the seafloor and, you know, on that ship, you've only got room for, let's say, 30 science, scientists. Now we're able to get those images and that video coming back to classrooms in real time. And well, first of all, can I ask what is an ROV? Sorry, a remotely operated vehicle. So <laughs> it's um, it's tethered. It's uh, it has to connect to a ship. I mean, is there? It seems in space, and I'm a layperson in all these discussions. But there's there's always a discussion about you know the benefits of having humans you know involved in the mission. And sometimes it seems the simple trade-off seems to be, you know, you can fit less other good stuff in if you've got a human there, but there's something sort of compelling about the narrative of, of human exploration of, of space that it, that yeah. drives excitement. Um, is, is that the same sort of debate that happens in, in ocean exploration? Absolutely. There's been a lot of pushback with the human-occupied vehicles. So we've got um, 
definitely made more of them. Uh, we've, but we only have, let's say, I think seven that exist. But this is another thing where philanthropic, you know, uh, just individuals have actually had a big impact. So James Cameron is one example, and Victor Vescovo in recent 2019 to 2020, they had um, the first efforts. But um, there's always going to be that curiosity and that human exploration that is definitely what pulls in uh, the scientific community, I'd say, the public. And when you say we have seven, who, who's the we? Uh, globally, yeah. So and, there's and so not se- a lot of seven what? Like seven kind of hu- human operated deep sea ve- vehicles. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So there aren't a lot that exist. So it's, I think that they're, they do have their advantages. I think uh, you can have that public engagement there. It's much more exciting when there's a human in there. That excitement, I think is communicated a lot better when, uh, when somebody's actually been there than, than when a robot's visited. And, and just in terms of the rate of change. So Graham commented on Moore's law and effectively space seeing the the consequence of Moore's law, but perhaps in some cases with a little bit of a lag because obviously it's an extreme environment, so other accommodation needs to be made. How would you characterise the rate of technological change that you're seeing in, in, in science being conducted in the deep oceans? Yeah, so we, um, we're a little behind in the deep ocean, so they're, uh, they're definitely, uh, the sensors have been developed and uh, for oceanography and for the benthos, for the, the, the seafloor, you actually have um, a greater need for imaging and those kinds of technologies. And so actually imaging specifically has developed uh, really well in recent years and the processing of those images very similar to space that you've got uh, machine learning and things like that that are actually allowing us to pull more from a huge volume of data so uh, so that's really helpful it's a it's an analogous situation but but yeah there's right now we're actually developing um, observatories that uh, you know for the deep sea the, the global community actually needs to come together and, and agree what are our essential variables that we want to measure. How are we going to measure them? How are we going to standardize them? And there's a deep ocean observing system group that um, that is actually integrating all those ideas. Great. I, I want to pick up that sort of question about what's driving the, the change at the moment. And is that coming from commercial operators? Is it coming from governments and science? And, and how's that being coordinated? But I'll come back to all of you on that. But I want to turn next to Mike from the British Antarctic Survey. So Mike, you've listened to Graham talking about space, Julie about the oceans. What's your experience in terms of kind of exploration and scientific research in in Antarctica? Yeah, so it, it overlaps quite a lot with both space and oceans. One of the big technological advances recently in the last sort of decade has been remote sensing. So what we can see from space, essentially, that's with optical imaging, with various radars, laser altimeters, where we can measure the height of the surface uh, very accurately. That complements from what we can do on the ground. So essentially, we're often trying to resolve spatial and temporal resolution. So from space, we can see a big area and and see see, uh, happening on a on a continent scale when you're on the ground you can see things happening uh, at far higher resolution and you can see it happening with a far higher time resolution but you're always trying to say well is it only happening where i've got my instrument or is it happening over a wider area the same drivers as, as well in the you know electronics has become far more capable, far lower power. Power is often the driver for us because we need to put instruments in places where the sun doesn't shine for many months of the year. So with the development in the computing power has and is starting to open up the, it has taken away the the restriction of what we could do in in a point locally with computing. We no longer really have that restriction. The restriction is in other things in in our case communications uh, getting data away from Antarctica. Uh, Robotics is making a big impact now as well. So uh, Julie mentioned ROVs. So ROVs around the oceans around Antarctica, underneath the ice shelves that hold the glaciers back in Antarctica. Um, They're very difficult access areas to access with anything other than an ROV. So there's obviously some some common ground. We're talking about miniaturisation, advance in electronics, information processing, automation. Mike, you mentioned power. I just wonder what you see as technological change happening in, in terms of powering these 
these different devices. You said partly it's efficiency, meaning that less power is needed. Are there other kinds of technological changes in, in terms of in Antarctica about about the, the, the kind of powering of, of the devices? Yeah, so the thing which has made the difference really has been the amount of power that um, instruments use, the, the efficiency gains from in the electronics. So we've gained you know, orders of magnitude of capability there. There is some slower change on uh, things like battery technologies, how good battery technology is, how good solar panels are, but they're all very slow and quite marginal changes compared to the gains that we've had in the electronics. Well, that's a really fantastic, from all three of you, fantastic overview for, for a sort of general audience about what technological change is, is making possible. Graham. I mean, just could I get you to reflect on maybe looking forward in what time periods does the space agency kind of think in terms of are you are you planning for the next 10 years, 20 years? What sort of forward planning horizons do you use? Yes, I mean, we're, we're looking up to, I would say, about 30 years out, remembering that um, we are very much at the, the start of the technology development curve in a lot of what we're looking at and that uh, it can take you know, 15 years, 20 years to get to uh, an operational capability. And indeed, you know, some of the science missions that ESA um, uh, organised that we're very much part of are on a sort of 20 year programme. So if you take the LISA mission, which is a you know gravitational observatory, if that's planned to be operational in the 2030s. The you know, prototype mission um, you know, took place about five or six years ago, so and had been under planning, you know, for at least another sort of five or ten years before that. So yeah, I mean, 30 years is not unusual in terms of um, you know planning. And ESA is the European Space Agency. Exactly. Which which the UK Space Agency is, is st- still cooperating with closely? What's the relationship? Yeah, absolutely. So it's not part of the European Union structure and it is a an intergovernmental organisation of which um, the UK is one of the member states. So, so as you're looking sort of 30 years into the future, where, where are you anticipating? Where are you planning for technological kind of advances to change what's possible? I mean, some of the areas are in uh, propulsion. I mean, propulsion in space remains, you know, a very important challenge. You know, both um, launch, propulsion for launch, um, uh, as I say, we've seen Elon Musk do some really exciting things with reusable rockets, but the fundamental rocket propulsion technology is still, you know, largely as it was uh, 50 or 60 years ago. And one of the things we've been looking at is um, creating a hybrid um, uh, jet and rocket engine, which takes advantage of the oxygen in the atmosphere, at least for the lower stages of launch, rather than having to carry all of its oxidant in tanks, which then makes launch much heavier. And we've been doing that in partnership with a company called Reaction Engines in Oxfordshire. So, yeah, that's an example of an area where we're doing that kind of long-term technology. And then there's propulsion in space where nuclear power has has the potential to support um, uh, much more longer duration and distant missions where solar power becomes uh, really unproductive. Now now I'm going to have a last question. And and this is really, I guess going to set up the kind of the series of, of discussions that we're, we're going to be convening, which is what would you think sort of the wider policy community, the, the, the wider public, what questions should we be grappling with now? What issues should we be thinking about that you can anticipate these technological advances will raise with respect to space? I mean, so one thing that I think has reached public consciousness is space debris, that as, as launches become cheaper, as satellites become smaller, we can expect there to be more stuff in near Earth orbit. And, and that raises problems and governance problems as well, because who's responsible when when things go wrong. I think most of us assume that even the best technologies will sometimes go wrong and have some unintended consequences. So that's one issue. What what do you think should be on the agenda for the sort of a, a wider policy and public community? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, there's a big discussion at the moment about whether we're transitioning from a paradigm where space is essentially a, an activity that supports uh, the Earth economy to one where we have a space economy um, with things sort of going on in space for space. And the beginnings of that can be seen in some of the in-orbit um, activity that is taking place. For example, refueling of satellites is is happening for the first time. And um, you mentioned debris. There's an expectation with the lower cost of launch and the cheaper production of satellites. We'll have many, many more satellites in orbit. And that will create issues around debris, the need for space traffic management, much greater use of robotics, questions of interoperability, and the need for a, um, a legal 
legal system and a system of standards that supports all of that. Great. Thanks, Graham. And so now, Julie, turning to the sort of same sort of questions for, for oceans. I mean, what technological change can you anticipate in the coming decade or two? And, and what questions do you think that raises that the wider community ought to be be, be starting to grapple with? So historically, um, industries have been really interested in the deep sea because, you know, there's a lot of resources in the deep sea, like oil and gas. And, um, and now uh, lately they've been considering metals. So things that you might put in your cell phone. Um, and so historically, um, actually, there hasn't been too much engagement of scientists except for to tick the boxes for policy. And that's totally changing. So um, so industry is actually bringing scientists in right at the front because they've actually got more data for the deep sea than we do um, as uh, as academic scientists. And, um, and I think that that's going to actually be our source of uh, data for the, the coming year. I think industry are really keen to take us on board and it's a actually really uh, mutually beneficial relationship. But, um, but if you were to um, talk about standardizing um, observations and things like that, so we're talking about new observatories and that in theory is litter on the seafloor um, once they're, they're not used anymore. But the deep sea community especially is really good about trying to retrieve things. So in recent years, they've, um, they've, invested in uh, not just diving for deployments, but diving for recovery of instrumentation, just because they know that we don't have the baseline data yet. We need to um, just make sure that we're not exploiting the ecosystems um, at the deep sea. But but the other thing is really quickly that uh, there's a net zero efforts in general in um, oceanography because ships are incredibly, they're a huge source of carbon. So um, so when we do our uh, environmental you know, assessments and things like that, we're actually burning a lot of carbon and putting it into the atmosphere. So um, I think that things are going to change in that regard. So there's, we know that there's some high potential solutions to um, doing observing in the, in the surface ocean. So we're already using solar panels and things like that. Um, But we, we need to kind of push that into the deep sea. There's, uh, there's a lot of potential projects that use things like ocean currents and, and pressure changes. And, you know, they're able to use, um, harvest energy from natural sources, but uh, but I think that's in the next thirty years. If you're talking about you know the biggest change, I think that's likely going to be fueling how we do observations. Dude, I'm very interested in in one aspect that seems different from the way Graham was talking because in in space it seems there's quite a c- close interconnection between the kind of commercial agendas and scientific agendas. Where, um, whereas the way you described it, there was sort of industry on one side and science on the other side. Do you see that likely to change? I mean, I think that part, part you know, again, as, as a citizen looking at this, and you're talking about the increasing capacity to explore deep oceans, I guess there's a question about exploitation and in a new and are there risks that there may be kind of unscrupulous exploitation of, of resources in the deep ocean? And who's going to control that? And how's the scientific community going to interconnect with, with uh, these sorts of questions? That always is a risk. And actually, there's seabed authorities that allow or don't allow exploitation of the deep sea resources. But they do increasingly require in- environmental impact assessments in collaboration with scientists. So that is why they have um, so many observations, actually. They're required to go down there and make sure that the ecosystem actually isn't uh, detrimentally impacted by their their efforts. And if it is, if they, they need to be able to compensate in some way. So when they when they leave, you know, they need to be cleaning up uh, what they've left behind. So you're you're fairly confident that we have a good governance arrangement at the moment. So we're not we're not kind of at risk of there being a kind of you know a wild scramble for resources that of the oceans. You feel that we, it's more under control than that. So I do know that there's a lot more um, recognition that we are exploiting the deep sea to an extent that we ne- don't necessarily know the impact of because the science just isn't there yet. So so yeah, so all the new industries that start actually do have that in mind because of international authorities that they need to be characterizing the baseline and determining whether the impact is going to be too detrimental to actually carry on. But like anything, uh, <laughs> commercial is commercial, right? There is a potential for for money to be speaking louder than than the scientists. So it's just a just kind of a careful um, way forward that we just need to make sure that we're always engaged. I think. So, Mike, right, uh, finally turning to you. So you've heard um, Graham talk about space and Julie about the oceans. 
how do you reflect on on what technological change may open up in terms of science in Antarctica and what what sort of questions should we be thinking about now to anticipate some of the implications of those changes? The big one that's on the imminent horizon really is the changes in communication technology. It's the, you know, the Starlink and the OneWeb, which we have almost no bandwidth out of of Antarctica at, at the moment in communications and and they'll change both our scientific capability enormously but also the the experience and the reality of of someone being in Antarctica you know how well connected they are how safe they are how well we can monitor them and things robotics is going to make a huge difference as well things that we can do um without people so and um, which is a really interesting area because there's some things where people do better than than robots you know it's very hard to to um get a robot to have the experience of a scientist about to spot one species of lichen over another species of lichen or one particular type of rock over another type of rock or something but um there are also things which uh, robots can just you know can do and um, uh, and it's a lot better to put a robot into a hazardous environment than a person. Like Julie, net zero is going to be a huge challenge to us. And I think that really is going to, to not only be a technological challenge, it's also going to be a discussion to be had about what use do we put Antarctica to. Operating in Antarctica, even getting to Antarctica, is extremely carbon intensive. Um, and... Um, there's going to be a question over, you know, how how not only do you manage that amount, how do you manage that number down, but also um, is it a good use of uh, an increasingly limited budget of carbon to, to spend that in Antarctica? You know, and, and what is Antarctica for? Great. Well, I just want to thank you both very much for really fascinating and you know, just overview. I know you're just sort of scratching the surface, but it's a wonderful way for us to start the series. We'll be back next week uh, to explore the exploitation and pollution of these environments. CSAP's Science and Policy podcast is a production of the Centre for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. The series is hosted by me, Rob Doubleday, and is produced by the fabulous Kate McNeil, with the excellent support of two PhD interns, Alice Millington and Anthony Lindley. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or visiting our website www.csap.cam.ac.uk. If you have any feedback about this episode or ideas for issues we could explore in future episodes, please email us at inquiries at csap.cam.ac.uk. Thanks for listening.